thank you for checking out my YouTube channel, The Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. I am your host, Nick Barksdale, and today we are joined again by Dr. Jacob Lackner. He is going to be doing a follow-up episode to our presentation previous on medieval anti-Semitism. This one is actually going to focus on more of the positive relations between Christians and Jews in a complex time period that we call the Middle Ages. This one is going to be titled Medieval Jewish-Christian Relations, Religious Tolerance in the Dark Ages. Dr. Lackner, I'm going to let you take it from here. All right. Well, thanks again for having me on. So um, as you said, last time I did a presentation on this channel, I talked about the negative interactions between Christians and Jews. And we saw that, especially starting in the late 11th century, Jews were intermittently attacked and persecuted by some of their Christian neighbors. We saw this manifest in large-scale massacres, such as during the First Crusade, um, and we also saw new fantastical kinds of accusations emerge against Jews. First, ritual murder, the idea that Jews murdered Christian children as part of their religion, uh, blood libel, which adds cannibalism to the same uh, accusation of ritual murder, host desecration, the idea that Jews steal the communion wafer with the intent to destroy it, and then finally, well poisoning, the idea that Jews caused the plague. And, and what all of these accusations have in common is that people, some people, and that's an important distinction, some people believed uh, that Jews were enemies of Christianity, not just non-Christians, but enemies of Christianity seeking to destroy it, and that they had to be stopped, in a way, from the perspective of people who really believe this. But, you know, we talked about all of that negative stuff last time and anti-Semitism and these accusations. And while it's very important to keep all of those things in mind, they were a part of medieval Jewish Christian relations. It's important to note that these were disruptions of what were normally fairly peaceful interactions between Jews and Christians living, coexisting, uh, cooperating in medieval Europe. Um, the things we talk about, you know, we want to avoid sort of a narrative that all of the Middle Ages is, um, uh, you know, negative stuff between medieval Jews and Christians, because in fact it was more positive stuff than it was negative. It's just that the negative stuff is so heavily documented because when it happened, it was so exceptional and problematic and people wrote about it. So in today's talk, I'm going to present a number of different case studies that show that Jews and Christians could and did have positive relationships with one another during the Middle Ages, the examples I'm going to look at include Jews serving as important merchants and diplomats, Jews being encouraged by local rulers to settle in towns, Jewish physicians who had Christian patients, Jews who were patrons of Christian artists and vice versa, and the kinds of relationships that existed between Jewish and Christian women who were neighbors uh, especially. And all of this will sort of temper what we talked about last time and really complicate it. You know, everything is very nuanced. It's, there's not things that are really black and white today, and there aren't in history either. Human inter interaction is very complicated, and that's what we're going to see here. You know, there are some medieval people who did believe certain very negative things about Jews, and sometimes those things became especially popular. But again, those are the exceptions. So, to start with today, I'm going to be I'm going to talk about uh, Jews living in uh, Carolingian uh, Europe. So. Uh, Carolingian, you know, the word uh, comes from the Latin word for Charles. Carolus gets its name from Charles Martel, who started a new dynasty of French rulers, of French kings and, and later emperors, who would be called the Carolingians because of him. The most famous of these Carolingians is Charlemagne. And Charlemagne uh, is who we're going to talk about first and sort of how he had Jews within his society and in his kingdom. For him, uh, he wanted Jews very much to be part of the society in, in the kingdom of France. Uh, and he also wanted Jews to uh, use some of their special skills that other people didn't have to help France, to help his new kingdom of the Franks. So uh, for one thing, it's important to remember, as we talked about last time, there are um, papal uh, laws essentially at the time that say, Jews cannot be in positions of power over Christians. And I talked about last time, you know, that's the rule, but people didn't always listen. Charlemagne's someone who didn't listen. Charlemagne appointed Jews to important offices. Uh, he had Jews in his court. He put people in positions of power when they're not supposed to be over Christians. Uh, he even, um, one of the specific rules that popes by the time of Charlemagne, around 800, have been saying for a long time at this point is that Jews can't have uh, slaves, essentially. 
unfortunately, slaveholding was very common in this time period, whether you were Jewish, Christian, or what have you. Um, and generally, the way things worked, and something that was a problem for Jews, is if they owned a slave uh, who wasn't Christian, someone else could convert that person to Christianity, and they lost the slave. Charlemagne says slaves of Jews can't be converted. So this is a Christian king who puts a law in place to make it so that Jews can keep having slaves. Again, slavery is a horrible thing, but it was unfortunately a societal norm at the time. Um, he, again, has them serve as magistrates, has them on his court. They're some of his chief advisors. And one of the things he has them do um, a lot is work as diplomats, Jews in his kingdom. This is because uh, he, he has various um, interactions with Islamic powers. So Charlemagne is in the kingdom of the Franks. At the time, not very far south from him, uh, is where the Umayyad Caliphate is headquartered. Uh, most of the Iberian Peninsula is under their control. And as famously chronicled in the Song of Roland, um, there were people, uh, Muslims, who were making ra raids into southern France. And so he had diplomatic relations with the Umayyad Caliphate, and he also had diplomatic relations with the Abbasid Caliphate, who was headquartered in Baghdad, so, you know, in the Middle East. And Jews are, were a group of people who were an accepted minority, a uh, tolerated minority in Christian Europe and in the Muslim world. And just as Charlemagne had Jews serving on his court and working with him, so too did Muslim rulers. And so if there was a linguistic barrier of any kind, by having a Jew who knows Hebrew go on these various diplomatic missions and speak with the, um, the Muslim advisor, who would have been Jewish as well and would have known Hebrew, that way they can sort of keep the communication open. And so uh, he sends uh, regularly diplomatic groups, and usually these groups who are going to meet with the Umayyad Caliph or the Abbasid Caliph, generally uh, they are Jews. The one really famous example of this to talk about is a guy named Isaac, who uh, right around the year 800 goes to the uh, Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad. He's just one member of a fairly large um, group of diplomatic emissaries who are headed there. And the, the reason Charlemagne wants to send them to Baghdad is to open up new negotiations uh, with the Abbasid Caliphate because... Both of them don't like the Umayyad Caliphate. That's the group in Spain that's raiding Charlemagne's territory, and the Abbasids see them as an illegitimate caliphate. So they agree that they don't like them. So he wants to create a military alliance of sorts with the Abbasids, and then they can just get rid of the Umayyads. That's Charlemagne's plan. And so Isaac is a Jew who is formerly a merchant and has traveled all throughout the world. He knows lots of languages, including Hebrew, maybe also Arabic. And so he is traveling um, on this uh, mission, and along the way, as happens on some of these long uh, missions um, over land in, the, in this time period, some of the people died. And it was the people leading this group who died. And Isaac becomes sort of the de facto leader because he's the most experienced, he knows what's going on, he knows the way. And so Isaac becomes the, you know, he's the only Jew in this group, and now he's sort of the leader. And he gets them all the way to Baghdad, and he opens negotiations with Harun al-Rashid, who's the caliph at the time. And um, they have very good negotiations, and Harun al-Rashid is very interested and wants to continue the discussion uh, with Charlemagne. And he sends back with Isaac all kinds of gifts, uh, a chessboard, ivory, and perhaps most impressively, because of how crazy difficult it must have been, Isaac also returns to uh, Charlemagne with a white Indian elephant that has been given to Charlemagne as a gift. So he brings back all of these gifts. Unfortunately, you know, this is something that is sometimes lost in history because in the long run, this negotiation didn't amount to much because Harun al-Rashid dies almost right after, not very long after this. And thus, the negotiations don't even matter. But the the illustration here of a Jew who's an important member of this Christian state, of this Christian society, whose job it is to help, um, you know, th this Christian state, the kingdom of the Franks, uh, create new diplomatic relations. You know, that's something that really complicates any sort of image that Jews were, you know, not really integrated into society entirely. Um, Charlemagne would be, you know, someone who ignored these papal pronouncements, and his son, Louis the Pious, um, also would continue to do the same exact sort of stuff, uh, using 
uh, Jewish diplomats. He would even use some of them to settle sort of frontier areas that they had conquered from the Umayyads um, because they were sort of more comfortable there. Uh, and um, one of the interesting things that Louis does that I think goes a really long way towards illustrating the importance of Jews from the perspective of the French kings at the time, especially economically, is that he decides he's going to move market day, the day when a bunch of people come to town and sell things from all over. He moves that market day from Saturday to Sunday. And he does this because Jews observe the Sabbath rather strictly. They don't work during the Sabbath, which is Saturday for them. The Christian Sabbath is on Sunday. So he actually moves it from the Jewish Sabbath to the Christian Sabbath. Of course, Christians do not observe Sabbath quite as strictly. So it isn't as much of an impact on them, but it is an interesting decision he makes that shows you how important they are. And to sort of transition from that, it's important to note um, that Jews during the early Middle Ages are sort of the major, major international merchants for Christian Europe. Um, they, just as they're sort of able to more easily enter into diplomatic relations because of their linguistic abilities and, and such, um, Jews also have an easier time, since they're an accepted minority in the Christian world and the Muslim world, they can very easily uh, travel between the two. Other people don't really have that luxury at the time, but Jews can. They're accepted in both places. And we have a really interesting source that I, I'm going to try to uh, remember to, to give to Nick to put uh, in, the, in the description, uh, by a, a Muslim geographer named Ibn Kordedba, who writes in the ninth century, and he describes this group of merchants that he calls the Radonites, who are Jewish merchants who travel as far west uh, as Spain and as far east as China. And they're multilinguistic. It's an international network of these merchants. And they're just as important in the Islamic world as in the Christian world, getting goods to the Christian world from Muslims and from, you know, to the Muslim world from the Christian world. Um, and these Radonites, you know, again, they have massive trade routes and they're viewed as really important. And, you know, that all sort of also is why Jews could also serve as good diplomats. Most of them were very well traveled. The, you know, the ones who be, got appointed as diplomats, it wasn't like they weren't qualified or something. They traveled throughout the world and knew what they were doing. So that's just sort of a brief overview in the Carolingian period, mostly under Charlemagne and Louis the Pious, of how uh, what Jews were like in that time and how important they were economically uh, and diplomatically. So. Uh, that's sort of the, the Carolingian uh, example I wanted to talk about. Um, to sort of jump forward a couple of hundred years, now we're going to uh, the, the Holy Roman Empire, specifically uh, the city, or it wasn't really a city then, that's kind of the point here, but to Spire, which was a town at the time. So around 1064, um, there is a man who is the noble, the ruler of Spire, essentially, who's also the bishop of Spire. That was a thing that happened, and his name is Rudiger. And he uh, is interested in, after sort of inheriting his office, he's interested in making Spire better. Um, and he comes up with an idea that he thinks will be a good way to do that. And that is that he... Um, write sort of a contract to a uh, prospective Jewish community that could come and live there at some point. Um, and in this letter, uh, which he writes, he first says that he wants to transform the village of Spire into a city, the city of Spire. Um, and by the way, this is also a source I'll hopefully have, have a link to uh, in the description below. Um, but in this contract, um, he, uh, yeah, he says he wants to make his city grow. He says he believes that by inviting Jews into the city, he can increase Spire's greatness a thousandfold. So keep in mind, this man's a bishop. Keep in mind, this man's also a noble. And he believes bringing Jews into the community will have nothing but a very positive impact. And so he writes this contract and it has all kinds of things in it. I'm just going to touch on some of them. It's another reason to look at it in the link. Um, and the different things he does to try to bring Jews into the community are, are especially interesting. One of them is essentially that Jews won't have to pay an exchange tax like everyone else. So if, you, if a Jew is inspired, they can exchange gold, silver, whatever, without having to pay an exchange tax. So you can see he's trying to uh, take advantage of Jew, Jewish merchants generally and bringing them to his city. He also... Uh, says that if a Jew should stay in Spire for a night with Jews who live here, they don't have to pay a lodger's tax 
And in, this is clever because it means that Spire will become a place that lots and lots of Jewish merchants will want to go to on their trade route because it's somewhere they can stay for free and sell their goods. And this is good for Rudiger and good for Spire. Then some of the other things on it are, are especially surprising, given the fact that he's a bishop. Uh, one of them is that he completely overrides what the popes have been saying by this point since Gregory the Great for about 500 years. You know, around 590, Gregory the Great, Great said, Jews cannot have Christian servants, period. Rudiger says, uh, actually, here in Spire, Jews can have Christian servants. They can hire servants from the Christians. And they can also hire wet nurses, in other words, women who are able to nurse and, and uh, be nannies, essentially, who can also feed uh, babies. And these are things that are not supposed to happen. He also gives them land to live on, the land that he's sort of going to add to the town. And he takes that land from the church, and, and it's from the church graveyard, and gives it to them. So all of this is really surprising, given that he's a bishop. But overall, this sort of contract that he composes, which has several other things that are beneficial for Jews in it, um, it was pretty normal in the Holy Roman Empire at the time. It was something a lot of people were trying to do because Jews were viewed as that positive uh, within the community by rulers. And in this case, by someone who also happens to be a bishop. So that's you know a really interesting example of someone who wants Jews to come to the community, thinks they're going to bring nothing but good, and he offers them some things that the Pope at the time probably was not very happy about. We unfortunately don't have any record of their exchange, but I can't imagine it was very good. We talked there, when talking about Rudiger of Spire's contract to the Jews in 1064, uh, we talked there about wet nurses. And that's a good way to segue into our next topic, which is some of the relationships there were between Jewish and Christian women. Um, there, most of what I'm going to talk about here is from a, a really great book uh, by Elisheva Baumgarten, uh, who wrote a book called Mothers and Children. And it's basically about how, I mean, her, her central argument, which is, it's a great one and it's fascinating, is that medieval Jewish and Christian women had more personal and more intimate relationships with one another than did their male counterparts. So for her, and I think it's a good argument and we'll talk about why, for her, this is where you have closest, you know, very commonly at least, what we can call friendships, uh, not just sort of, uh, you know, acquaintances or business relationships. In this case, we have some clear examples of friendships between Jewish and Christian women who are neighbors. Um, they had very personal relationships, intimate relationships with one another. But before we get to sort of, uh, you know, the neighbors and those interactions, uh, let's talk about wet nurses. So, you know, it may seem like a strange practice to us today, but it was pretty common, whether you were Christian or Jewish, especially if you were uh, wealthy or busy and weren't a mother who necessarily had time to stay home and uh, nurse your children all the time. You would hire a woman who had recently had a child, too, and thus was lactating and could serve as not only, you know, a nanny, but could also serve the purpose of feeding the child. And... Medieval uh, Jews regularly hired Christian women for this purpose, more than they hired Jewish women. The reasons for this, you know, it's hard to say exactly. One of the key ones is probably that on average, Jews were generally, you know, especially in uh, Germany, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, which is mostly what I'm talking about with this example. Uh, Jews there, during the times when times were good, were generally more affluent than their Christian neighbors, and Jewish women uh, much more commonly worked than their Christian counterparts. So they were outside of the home doing things, whether, you know, merchant work, whether as money lenders, um, they were just regularly outside of the home. They were, they were business women in a way that was much, much, much less common in the Christian world at the time. And so it made sense for them to hire someone. And, the, and meanwhile, most Jewish women are occupied working. So the people you can hire are generally going to be from the poor, and there were usually more poor Christian people because there were more people, and thus Jews regularly hire these Christian wet nurses. And now this is where, you know, this is a great example to say, well, if Jews and Christians really hated each other during the Middle Ages for various reasons, why would a Jewish woman trust a Christian woman with her child? And that's exactly the point. They didn't hate each other during the Middle Ages all the time. I mean, there were problems, as we've discussed in the previous video, but they didn't. You know, Jewish women trusted Christian women to be wet nurses. Uh, 
Um, they had fairly intimate relationships with one another. Um, the Jewish woman was the one who did the hiring, the one who negotiated, the one who spoke with her on a regular basis. It wasn't the place of the Jewish man. I mean, it's something that has to do with raising of a child, especially as an infant. And that's something within Jewish culture that falls within the realms of the woman's sort of sphere. Um, and thus, she was the one interacting regularly with this wet nurse. And we have some records of sort of friendships developing, you know, not just sort of a business relationship, but real friendships. Um, for example, uh, we an interesting thing about this whole section about women is we have a fair number of sources about all of it. And the reason we do is because both Christian and Jewish men were concerned about what was going on, this sort of interfaith um, relationships between, you know, friendships between women. Um, and they wrote letters to their respective religious authorities, making sure it was OK. So most of our records of this are people being worried about it. But uh, so it's kind of why we, we know a lot about it. But one example where we have one of these letters is that a Christian uh, woman was given by her Jewish um, uh, employer, uh, this Christian uh, wet nurse, was given gifts at the holiday of Purim, a holiday where Jews, uh, you know, they donate gifts essentially to the poor. And she gave them to not a poor, not poor Jewish people, but to her Christian um, wet nurse. And the husband was concerned about this. The rabbi said it was fine in the letter. You know, there's a whole lot of literature called response to literature where we have all of these letters that tell us a lot about daily life like this. And that's one example of that. Um, but these women, uh, you know, they, they had very close relationships and there has to be some inherent trust there. You know, it's not like you, you wouldn't trust them if you really believe they hated you and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's one area where Jewish women interacted. Other areas where we see more personal relationships um, is, uh, and it's again, most of our records are because men were worried about it. One of these things that was common, especially in, in Germany in the Middle Ages, especially 13th century and later, uh, was communal ovens. And women, whether you were Jewish or Christian and living you know, as neighbors, you used the same sort of communal cooking space. And thus, you were just around each other because you were cooking all the time. And we have a lot of examples of women exchanging recipes. Um, and this is something, especially on the Jewish side, because of ideas of um, uh, you know, eating kosher, Jewish dietary laws, a lot of Jewish men were very concerned that their wife had made them something for dinner and said, oh, they got this recipe from, you know, our Christian neighbors, you know, my, my friend next door. And, you know, generally what rabbis say about that one is, well, as long as, you know, your wife cooked it and it doesn't have anything in it that you're not supposed to eat, it's fine. But some, it, some, it really concerned some men. But it's interesting, it didn't concern the women that much who just decided to cook the recipe. Um, and I'm sure Jew Jewish women gave recipes to Christian women too. We just don't have as much of a record of it because it wasn't, Christians wouldn't be quite as concerned about that situation as Jews would be because of dietary restrictions. Uh, we also have some examples of men writing letters and asking if it's okay that their wife, um, this, and this is again, something you see more on, the, on in Jewish uh, sources, asking if it's okay that uh, a man asking if it's okay that his wife uh, has borrowed a dress from her Christian neighbor, you know, like if there's some something wrong with that. Um, and uh, so, you know, that's a very personal kind of relationship, women uh, trading clothing, uh, sharing clothing, and sort of the most in, in um, the place where we have the most sort of uh, stuff to go on, where we have the most sources, where the men were concerned the most, and where we even have some sources uh, that may have originally uh, come from women, um, is that women um, gave a lot of birth, child rearing, and grief advice, like after losing a child to one another, regardless of their religion. Um, and interestingly, uh, the general sort of ruling about this was that, you know, if, if a woman had gotten some, was really nervous about having a baby, she hadn't had a baby yet, and her Christian neighbor had, she could tell her things like things that helped her or things to soothe her, much more effectively than her male Jewish husband would have any hope of doing. Um, and generally, on both sides here, uh, both by the, by the church, uh, local bishops and the like, and by, by rabbis, most of the time what they say is, look, they know, you know, basically lo using logic, they say, you should sort of keep track of what they're saying to one another if you're suspicious or worried, 
but chances are that it's fine. They're both women and they know more about this than we do, is sort of the way it's kind of viewed at the time by both parties. Um, and so, you know, women helped each other with their anxiety about child rearing, about childbirth, regardless of their faith. And again, this is all largely happening and probably where a lot of these friendships begin is around these communal ovens. Um, you know, have you have neighbors of the other faith. And then we also have some examples of grief advice. Um, in particular, uh, we have a text called the Sefer Hasidim, the Book of the Pious, a Jewish text that talks about um, uh, a, a Jewish woman whose child got run over by a cart and killed, and that her Christian neighbor was like her her best friend during this time and told her about how she had lost a child and uh, it was very difficult for her. And, and in a way, it seems like both sides um, eventually come to a conclusion that these are very, these are, these are women things and they're universal women things. And it doesn't matter about the faith, uh, according to people on both sides. Eventually, there are people who are concerned, but, but that all shows you that there, these are very personal relationships, uh, close relationships between uh, Jewish and Christian women. And these things are the norm. These aren't the kind of, I mean, we have piles and piles of sources of these kinds of things. Um, they were the norm. And it's, it's really interesting to see, um, and as Elisheva Baumgarten argues, I think she's right. These are much more personal relationships, at least that we have a detailed record of, and at least at a higher frequency than we see between their male counterparts. So uh, that's women. We'll move from there, another sort of segue, talking about childbirth and all of that. We'll move now to Jewish physicians. So now let's talk about uh, Jewish doctors. So especially starting in the 13th century, Jewish uh, Jews much, uh, let me restart, <laughs> especially starting in the 13th century, uh, Jews more frequently become physicians, doctors, people who care for people, other people medically. Um, and this, it is an important thing to note, you know, it, what I'm saying here isn't that all Jews were doctors. It's definitely not the case. It was probably something like 1% of the population. But that's actually pretty high, especially compared to the Christian. You know, 1% doesn't sound like a lot, but one in 100 people being a doctor is a higher rate than it is today. But for, for Jews in the Middle Ages, around one in 100, in, especially in France and Germany, uh, were, were physicians. Um, and this was especially true starting in the 13th century, after Jews are sort of trying to find um, way, different ways to work uh, as persecution in a lot of ways is becoming a bigger part of their lives or at least it's difficult for them to join craft guilds and things like that. Um, and so, so a lot of Jews become doctors, and they quickly become to be considered, even by Christians, um, as maybe the best physicians there are. So what's the reason for this? Well, it's kind of interesting. So Jews are barred from medical school at this time, and they would be until about the 16th century. This is because universities are religious organizations at the time, and you had to take a religious oath. You had to be Christian to be at a university, and Jews could not go to these universities. But Jews actually do have a lot, rather long history of, a longer history of medicine. Um, someone like Maimonides, who lived in what is today Egypt, um, he was a great rabbi, but he was also a physician. And in the Islamic world, there were a lot of Jewish physicians, much more earlier uh, than we see in the Christian world. And Jews who are living in Europe have access to a lot of these sources, which includes things that have been translated uh, from ancient Greek, an you know, ancient Greek medical texts like Hippocrates, which have been translated into Arabic by, by Muslims and then translated into Hebrew by uh, Jews. And then these texts can circulate, and so Jews are still getting a medical education, and in some ways a better one than their Christian counterparts are, because they have access to all these texts that aren't actually rediscovered in the Christian world until like the 14th century. So they have access to uh, important ancient Greek medical texts that, that Christian doctors just don't have at the time. Um, additionally, the way a lot of Jewish physicians operated was kind of similar to how they worked with, with other uh, issues or questions they had. Uh, I mentioned earlier responsa literature. This is essentially where if you were a Jew and you were concerned about something theologically and you needed some advice about it, you wrote to who you thought was the greatest rabbi in the region or, or even in the world in some cases, and he would answer your question. 
You know, that's what a lot of these men were writing letters to concerned about their wives' relationships with their Christian neighbors. Um, so in the same similar vein, uh, doctors, Jewish doctors, sent letters out a lot asking how to treat certain things. And these letters would be copied and written down and put into uh, compendiums. This is the same thing that happens with responsa. That's why we have so many of them. People just collected all of them. When they passed through the town, they would copy them down just on the route to whoever was being asked the question and after the question was answered. And so, in a way, it's kind of an early medical journal that emerges where Jews are circulating these written texts saying, I treated this disease this way and it was effective. And, you know, it sort of gives people examples and a study. Um, so Jews sort of take the way they work with theological questions and do the same sort of thing with medicine. And thus Jews sort of have, uh, they have an advantage over Christian doctors at the time in terms of access to ancient Greek medical texts. And they also have an advantage just in terms of uh, greater circulation of medical ideas than uh, Christians were doing at the time. So, and in addition to that, you know, the other way this training worked is, um, you know, you would be, if you wanted to be a doctor, you had to do a lot of reading and stuff. And, and a Jewish, uh, an already practicing Jewish doctor would eventually take you on based on whether he thought you had the capability and the knowledge. And then you would shadow him for one or two years as he goes about treating people for diseases, uh, being a doctor. And this is sort of like an intern sort of program uh, that you sort of have today. So all of this ends up leading to Jews uh, overall at the time, in the 13th century especially, uh, and in the 14th century to some extent, being considered to be the best doctors around. So what's the problem with this for Christians? Well, for a lot of them, there isn't one. Um, Jews, you know, they're, they're, they are a minority. So most of their patients, they're Christians. They're treating Christians. And eventually this starts to upset some people. Um, in the 14th century, uh, there's a council in Avignon in 1341 that says Jews, uh, no matter, it's an actually an interesting text too that I'll try to remember to link because it says specifically, no matter how great and better Jewish doctors are, you can't go to them. And, and this is because the rationale for this, it kind of makes sense. It's that Jews can't do the last rites. They can't do extreme unction, the sacrament that makes sure you get into heaven, according to many, or better chance of getting into heaven. Only a priest can do that, and thus, a, and a Jew can't. So you're putting your soul at risk. If you have a Jew, if you're dying, and you have a Jew as your physician trying to save you, you're putting your soul at risk. Um, and so people are encouraged not to do it, but like a lot of things, you know, no matter, it is the church, and the church was powerful in the Middle Ages, but a lot of people didn't listen. Um, lots and lots of Christians had Jewish doctors, especially when people had already tried Christian doctors and it hadn't been successful. And this is just sort of a logical thing. You know, if you imagine, um, you know, if you've experienced it yourself or you know someone who has, if you have someone who has a, uh, a really difficult illness that regular doctors, as we consider them today, aren't fixing, you might turn to Eastern medicine. You know, it's the same sort of thing where it doesn't matter what religion they are if I think they can save my loved one. Um, and the interesting thing is, even though some church councils said don't do this, um, we actually have lots of examples of people in the church having as their personal doctor, sort of on retainer, Jewish people. Um, the most notable example is that Pope Boniface IX in 1390 uh, had a Jewish physician. So he had a Jewish doctor, uh, as did the Archbishop of Toledo, the Archbishop of Ai, the Bishop of Treves, uh, Cardinal Pierre of Luxembourg. The list goes on. Lots, lots and lots of people had Jewish physicians. Um, and again, if people really believed Jews were these horrible people who were trying to destroy Christianity, if everyone believed that all the time, you wouldn't trust them to treat you with medicine. Um, but that. Again, that's what complicates any sort of idea that everyone felt that way, because this, again, is the norm. Jewish doctors treating Christian patients in the Middle Ages uh, was the norm. So the last sort of example I want to look at is when we look at art uh, and, in, you know, uh, Jewish patrons for Christian art and vice versa. I'm going to ask a question real quick, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, the Pope that you mentioned that had the Jewish doctor. Yeah. Was that before or after the uh, Council of Avignon? It's after. 
Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So he's just, he's just kind of like, well, I'm the Poe, so I mean, I'll kind of do whatever I want, you know? <laughs> I love yeah. It. Yeah. Well, it's kind of complicated. Um, if we go deeper into it, you have the whole issue of the Avignon papacy at the same time. Ooh, uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. If we really that's go, true. yeah, it, it does make things more complex. But the fact is, you know, the, yeah. Some church councils said don't have Jewish doctors, and meanwhile, the Pope had a Jewish doctor. Yeah, so it's, interesting. It's, yeah, that's a good point. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, that's that's good. That's valid. Yeah, yeah. So let's start first by talking about Jewish patrons for Christian art. So why would Jews want Christians to do their art? Well, generally, especially because in terms of figural art, Christians were just better at it. Uh, Jews, it's sort of, there's sort of an interesting ebb and flow in the Middle Ages for Jews as to how strictly to observe the idea that, that you should not have craven images, you know, the, the commandment uh, about that. And sometimes Jews say, we can't have images of humans at all. And other times they say, yeah, they're fine. It doesn't matter. There's ups and downs. Jew Judaism doesn't have a central dogmatic authority. It depended on where you were, when you were, all of that, uh, how strictly you interpreted it. But regardless, because you never really knew how people were going to rule on it, Jews who studied art and became artists um, a lot of the time didn't even look at figural art because it wasn't really as much a part of their culture. So if you were a Jew at some point in the Middle Ages and you wanted to have images of people in your books or elsewhere in artwork, it was better to turn to a Christian artist who was well-versed and knew how to do these things because Christians never really reject that idea that you can have images of people in your art. So um, we have a lot of examples of these, especially from the later Middle Ages, especially in Italy, where the Renaissance is sort of taking off and there's lots of artistic stuff going on. And we have uh, in Italy, especially, we have all of these examples of um, notaries because in the, in the 15th century, especially, they started notarizing everything, which is great for historians because we have all these receipts for people paying for art. Unfortunately, in the earlier Middle Ages, we have less of that, and we have to go on some different information to try to figure out you know, whether or not maybe this Jewish book was illustrated by a Christian. Um, so some examples of Jews patronizing, you know, having Christian artists do stuff for them. Uh, the earliest example we have is from 1152, when Rabbi Ephraim of Regensburg writes about uh, having stained glass windows, a very Christian thing, on his synagogue done by Christian artists. So that's one example where we have straight up him saying, you know, I had Christians make these windows for my synagogue. We don't have that many people directly saying that. Um, but it's pretty interesting. It's, again, one of those things where if Jews were really concerned about their Christian neighbors, would they have had them make um, put stained glass windows into their holy building? Probably not if they thought, you know, they were they were bad people. Um, and so that's one example earlier in the Middle Ages where we know it happened. Other times in the Middle Ages where it happens, we unfortunately instead have to sort of rely on uh, sort of a uh, deductive reasoning, trying to figure out why art looks a certain way. Um, there are lots of Jewish illuminated manuscripts, an illumination basically meaning an illustration. Um, during uh, the Middle Ages, some of them had to have been done by Christians. Some of them might have been done by Jews. But I want to talk about three sort of kind of funny, really, examples of Christians, almost definitely Christians who illuminated Jewish books, very important Jewish books, but screwed something up because they don't know about Jewish culture. Um, so one example we have of this uh, is from 1250, uh, and it's in a makzor, and these images will hopefully be on, on your screen during this video. A makzor is a text where uh, that Jews use during their holiest holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It's what they read from liturgically. So it's a very, very important text. Those are the two holiest holidays in all of Judaism. And uh, these particular Jews wanted to have this very important book illuminated, illustrated by their Christian uh, neighbors, by Christian artists. And the Christian artists did, but there's one page in particular where something kind of funny happened. Well, if we look at this illumination uh, right side up, the way it's supposed to be because of Hebrew, you notice that the actual illuminations are upside down. So you can't actually tell what's going on in this particular uh, example of art, if the Hebrew is right side up. And that makes sense. A Christian isn't going to know what direction Hebrew goes in. 
if you flip the page upside down, so the Hebrew's upside down, you can clearly see that there's an archer, there's a scene with a stag, there's all kinds of cool stuff going on there. But if you flip the page the correct way, it's upside down. So this is just an example of an illuminator not really knowing Hebrew and not really knowing what they were doing. And a Christian, a, J a Jewish illuminator wouldn't have done that because they would have known what, they, what was going on. Um, another example of this comes from the Kaufman Haggadah, uh, which dates from around 1300. Uh, a Haggadah is a Jewish text that is read during Passover, so another important Jewish holiday. And this text, uh, you know, it, it tells the story about the Jews coming out of Egypt. That's what Passover celebrates. Um, it has all kinds of uh, different liturgical things that you do during the holiday, what you eat, how you eat it within it. Um, and the illuminator in this case was probably Christian because he put images of Jews sitting in synagogue um, sort of like he probably would have done if, if it were a, a Christian book. He would have put Christians sitting in a church. And the mistake he makes that gives it away as probably a Christian artist is that in this case, a Jewish man and his wife probably are sitting right next to each other. And that isn't how synagogues worked in the Middle Ages. And it's still how synagogues today don't work if you're not, if you're Orthodox or, or high, you know, Orthodox or ultra Orthodox. Men and women are separated. Women usually would be in an upper gallery area looking down, and the men would be on the ground level. Again, a, a Jewish artist wouldn't have put a man and a woman next to each other like that sitting in the synagogue. So again, that's, that's a mistake that was made by a Christian artist who was tasked with doing this, but didn't have, you know, all the knowledge of Judaism, uh, you know, that he, he might have needed. Uh, and then the last example to look at is uh, from some, a book called The Shokin Bible. Um, this is the Bible, the, the, the Hebrew Bible, known as the Old Testament by Christians, and it's illuminated. And in particular, there's one medallion in the book uh, that shows Esau uh, coming back from a hunt, uh, and he has a hare on his back. He's carrying a hare, a rabbit, essentially on his back, and he's you know going to take it home and, and cook it. But hares aren't kosher. So the Christian artist in this case doesn't know Jewish dietary laws, and they're just you know they're drawing something that they think looks cool and you know will be fun. But it would have been something that a Jew would have been sort of concerned about seeing in their book because Esau should be eating and keeping kosher. He shouldn't be eating uh, a rabbit, as this would indicate. So those are just a few examples. There are a lot more. They're actually uncovering more and more of them with ultraviolet light. Uh, sometimes in these uh, illuminated manuscripts, everything in it comes out and they didn't do anything that would be culturally strange for a Jew to do. But when we take an ultraviolet light, we see that the directions, um, what the what the client wanted illuminated somewhere, are written in Latin, not in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So that's other example of how we know. And then we have we have so many receipts from the later part of the Middle Ages of of this happening. Um, you know, uh, in Palermo in 1379, uh, a Jewish community commissioned um, some silver apples for their Torah scrolls. Uh, 1376, in another Italian town, Montalcino, a Jew named Benjamin uh, commissioned illuminations for his Mokzor. Uh, in 1441, in Benedetto, two Jewish brothers had their Mokzor illuminated. Those are just a few examples. But those, again, Jews are having Christians take their holiest texts and are wanting them to illuminate them. Again, not something you would do if you didn't trust Christians. And, you know, some Christians clearly made mistakes, <laughs> and that happens. But, uh, you know, the the point is you wouldn't trust uh, Christians to do it if you really thought you were always in danger from them, for example. And then if we flip things the other way, looking at Christian patrons for Jewish art, we have fewer examples, but we do have some that are particularly interesting. For example, in around 1350, the Council of Nuremberg, an imperial free city, uh, had a Bible uh, bound by a Jew. And we think in general, book binding was something that Christians turned to Jews for a lot. Um, in learning sort of um, the things you're supposed to learn as a Jew, one of the things you're supposed to be able to do is bind books. Um, and it's just something you learn as a Jewish boy, especially in the Middle Ages. And so Jews sort of, you know, they're brought up binding books more regularly than their Christian counterparts. And if you want a nice binding for your book, a lot of Christians would turn to their Jewish neighbors. 
And there are a lot of examples where we think it was probably bound by a Jew for various reasons, but this particular Bible um, that's still held in the library in Nuremberg, uh, this Jew was proud of his work on this uh, particular binding, and he wrote in Hebrew on it that this was bound by Mer, you know, the, the book binder, essentially. So he straight up says that, and that's a very concrete example where we know of, but there are probably a lot more. Just like with art, there are some concrete examples but not everything has survived. But Jews were binding important Christian books. In this case, he's binding a Bible, which contains the New Testament, and mm -hmm. there's not any concern about that by the council of this city. Um, the other pretty interesting thing that happens in the Middle Ages, uh, spe specifically on the island of Sicily, is that Jews, Jewish jewelers essentially, start making coral rosaries. Uh, they start making rosaries out of coral, and they become incredibly popular. Um, they become popular throughout all of Europe. Uh, they were kind of the hip rosary to have in the 15th century. If you look at a lot of art from the time, you'll see people have these red rosaries. That's what they were probably made by Sicilian Jews in Sicily. And this is, you know, we're talking about uh, not quite Italy, but Sicily, very close. We have a lot of notarial records from there and elsewhere. And we have, you know, pounds and pounds of these rosaries being sold even overseas to Marseille, to France. Uh, in total, throughout all of Europe uh, for the 15th century, we have 370 contracts for these rosaries. That's how, how big they were. So Christians are at this time, uh, you know, uh, Catholics who use their rosaries uh, for liturgical purposes, for ritual purposes, they in many cases, know that Jews have made these things, but they have them anyway. And again, if you really thought Jews were enemies of Christianity, would you really be able to have their rosary and use it in your ritual practices? Not so much. So these are all the things that really complicate any sort of idea that the Middle Ages uh, were dominated by Jews and Christians hating each other, persecution against the Jews for various reasons. Those things happened, again, and they're important to know. That's why we talked about them in the first video. But the things we talked about today, these are sort of the daily life kind of things that medieval Jews and Christians were doing with one another and interacting with one another, rather than sort of the extreme events that sometimes happen between Jews and Christians. So I do have a question, if you don't mind. Um, we think, and typically like a lot of the, between Jews and Christians in the Middle Ages, we've covered art and we've covered uh, other basic aspects of social life between women, between men, trade, more of an economic and social aspect. Do we have any sources between, like, let's say, uh, I, you know, a lot of people don't really, movies don't even portray it, but like uh, Jews serving alongside uh, Christians in armed conflicts in the Middle Ages. Is that, are there any sources like that that cover that? There are some. So um, there aren't a ton of them, as far yeah. as I'm aware, but I know that in England, uh, there are a few examples of Jews who served as crossbowmen, like during the Hundred Years War and things like that. Um so I know that it it happened. Um, it wasn't super common in the Christian world for the most part. Um, this is partly because just the way um, way militaries worked at the time. Uh, you know, it was a very you know the the feudal system, manorialism, all of that kind of thing. There were those who fought, and then and Jews weren't among those for the most part. Okay. But there are examples of it, and I'm sure there are even more times where it happened that we don't have records of. Um, but I, as I, I recall, I can't tell you exactly where, um, but I do recall, you know, in, in my research encountering um, stuff, because my research is really about medieval, uh, the conversion of Jews to Christianity. Um, and um, there's in particular one uh, crossbowman who was in the English army who converts to Christianity. Um, so... Mm -hmm. I know of him, and I'm sure there are more. Was that a peaceful conversion, or would you say it's more of coerced? It was a peaceful conversion, yeah. That's, I mean, we could do a video on that at some point. But <laughs> Oh, I would love that. Actually. Because it relates back to all of this, too. There's, you know, there, Jews did get forcibly converted, and that was horrible. Oh, yeah. But, but there are actually a lot of examples of Jews willingly converting to Christianity for a multitude of reasons, romance being one of them. Um, being uh, excommunicated from the Jewish community, being another, there, there are a lot, you know, lots and lots of examples of voluntary conversion. 
There are also, on the interesting flip side, instances of Christians converting to Judaism voluntarily. So they're much rarer, but they're also interesting. But That'd make yeah. for a pretty interesting episode also, actually. Yeah. That'd be... Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching this awesome presentation by Dr. Lackner on a very complicated subject involving Jews and Christians in the Middle Ages. This one covered the positive aspects from art to intimate relations between Christian and Jewish women, going through a variety of different sources and references from looking at art to looking at documents. We see this complicated society that we honestly cannot ignore if you want to see the entire picture. I found it absolutely fascinating, and I thank him so much for his time. He took us from the Carolingian Empire into the Holy Roman Empire into, really, almost the end of the Middle Ages itself. We covered a wide variety of topics, and honestly, because of people like him, people like us are able to learn as much as we can about not just ancient history, but also the Middle Ages. Dr. Lackner, thank you so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for watching. Comment your thoughts and opinions below and have a great night. Mm -hmm.